Hello everyone and welcome back to Realism Overall Sandbox in Kerbal Space Program 1.8.1. In this video I continue to explore NASA's nuclear propulsion architecture by launching more components of it into orbit, meeting up with the components that we already have in orbit. So we've got this NTP tank which also has the propulsion unit with three nuclear uh, thermal rockets or nuclear thermal propulsion units. And uh, I've decided to wait a little bit longer than I did last time. so. We've got a little bit more relative inclination that we'll have to correct during launch, but hopefully the timing is uh, better for a quicker rendezvous. We'll see. So throttle up, SAS is on, and ignition. And launch. So let me get the fairings into the right place. So there was a question about how to use fuel depots and Oh, so potentially this sort of architecture, nuclear architecture, in a practical manner. And that can be fleshed out. It depends on sort of the inputs, right? It depends on whether you've got some in-situ resource utilization on the moon or on an asteroid, in which case a fuel depot would be very useful around that moon or asteroid. Um, as far as this nuclear propulsion system is concerned, it's good if you've got something like Starship that can launch a 100 ton hydrogen tank um, directly to orbit. Basically what we've got is a big ship that's going to be in high orbit. And the habitat area of that ship is not much smaller than the habitat area of Starship. So. It, the one thing is, it's not going to land on the surface of Mars. We're going to, at Mars, have a different lander doing things between the surface of Mars and orbit around Mars. And that lander will just hang out around Mars. So there's a better, there's sort of an efficiency compared to with Starship in that we're having different pieces do different things. It probably doesn't even take a hundred, uh, no, it probably takes about a hundred tons of hydrogen to refuel this ship. So. It's not quite one starship launch because one starship launch involves it just getting to low Earth orbit, whereas we need to get the stuff to high orbit. So we would take a little bit more than that. It might take three starship launches to refuel it, but that's still better than actually refueling a starship. So, yeah, basically. And separation of boosters, that's a little bit late. You could top off the tanks with more launches with like a new Glenn or something. Uh, that's, you know, up to you. And you can refuel it at your leisure. You don't need a big launcher to top off either the fuel depot or the nuclear ship. Now, the fuel depot around low Earth orbit could be used to refuel drones that, for instance, clear Earth orbit of debris. There's that sort of thing. Of course, the inclination thing, uh, if they're using hydrologs, they'll need to boost up to high orbit, change their inclination, come back down and grab the thing and deorbit it. But something like that could be done. Uh, obviously, putting the depot around the moon is much better. But there are uses just around low Earth orbit, if you've got some small things that need topping off every now and again. Another thing for low Earth orbit for the fuel depot is like my Shuttle Mark II. The Shuttle Mark II can launch and go to the moon. It's got hydrogen oxygen tanks, goes to the moon, makes orbit, comes back, captures back into low Earth orbit by aero braking, rendezvous with the fuel depot, and then gets refueled. And again, the fuel depot with hydrogen and oxygen as opposed to just hydrogen uh, can also be refueled by Starship. And since it's in low Earth orbit, uh, it will just take one launch of Starship to top off the ACES fuel depot. And so one launch of Starship would be good enough to have the Shuttle Mark II uh, go perhaps three, four trips to the moon. And again, uh, if you're looking to send 100 people to the moon, obviously that's not going to be useful. But if you're only sending four to six people to the moon at a go, then that's very useful. It's not efficient to send Starship to the moon for four to six people. So, it depends on cargo. You could, uh, there's cargo you could send to the moon with Starship. But still, it's a lot to fuel up at the end of the day. 
And as far as using SLS Block 1B for this, obviously, it's because I said in the title NASA's nuclear architecture. If uh, SpaceX wants to propose one, that's fine. <laughs> but we are using SLS Block 1B because it is the most likely launcher to launch this architecture, given that it's NASA's architecture at this point. And the modules all seem to be sized to make use of some form of SLS. Okay, separation and ignition. Nozzle extension. But yeah, in general, I think a lot of my videos are gonna explore the various uses of these depots and these ships and stuff like that. All the stuff that I've made, uh, I made them precisely to explore the uses of it. And maybe there are things that I haven't thought about that in the course of trying to run missions with them, I'll find out, ah, it's uh, it could be useful for this situation that we did not anticipate. Or maybe it's not as useful as it seemed originally for various situations. So we actually have to try and conduct the missions to find out whether my sense that it might be useful for this or that is actually true. So what I'm doing right now is obviously I want my closest approach to be right around periapsis and I want my descending node to be right around periapsis too. This is probably close enough uh, as far as the descending node is concerned. So even though the relative inclination is going up I don't mind that because what we want to do is there's going to be a big burn that involves us boosting from this low orbit to match the target's orbit, which is very high. And if we need to do a 1 or 2 degree inclination correction at the same time, that's not going to make a big difference to the delta V overall. So we just want to make sure that we can do it in the same place, even if we've got more of an inclination to deal with. As long as it's not something obscene, it's fine. This is different than rendezvousing with ISS because ISS is not in a high orbit. You want to really be attentive to the relative inclination during launch and minimize that by the time you shut off the upper stage. It looks like we'll be behind the target. I waited a little bit too long this time, maybe. Okay, I'll shut off there. So, we've got a periapsis there. Well, actually there. The tangency here. I think what I'll do is I'll actually let it hang out for one orbit and meet up with it on the next orbit and we'll immediately launch another tank. So here we're almost doing the whole deal. But we'll wait until we get here to finish it off. So it'll be on its own for two days. I don't know how long the EUS can hang out. Uh, if it's ever meant to do a uh, maneuver around the moon, it should be able to handle two days. Uh, I don't know if they've got it to that level. And ignition. Okay, well, I finished a little bit of an RCS correction. We've got a close approach distance of 7.9 kilometers, but it's so sensitive that I don't want to stop this from rotating. <laughs> because I'm afraid that any puff of the RCS will throw it off. So, yeah, that's our current situation, and actually we probably don't need this stage anymore, but we'll have a tag around. The end burn would probably be done by RCS only anyway. The speed matching burn. Even in our rotational state, electric charge is recharging. So, okay, all right. Uh, we'll set an alarm for when to pay attention to this. Um, let me say it there. Okay, so let me uh, launch another tank, and I'll deliberately launch this immediately, even though that means that we aren't going to do an immediate uh, rendezvous. We'll just get into a low orbit and basically do the same thing as uh, with this, and wait nearly two days to rendezvous. Okay, so this is pushing it. We have a relative inclination of 13.8 degrees and it's increasing and I need to launch immediately because it's just going up rather quickly. Um, we'll see if this can be managed. 
My usual limit is like 10 degrees for corrections during launch, as far as inclination is concerned. But we took nearly an hour to deal with the previous launch, so we've progressed a bit. Of course, they would definitely not be launching SLS Block 1Bs every two days, much less every... I mean, yeah. They're not going to be launching them this frequently. Whatever is going to be assembled will probably take the entire two years between Mars opportunities. If it gets done at all. Personally, and I don't think I'm alone on this, I think there's much more reason to go with nuclear electric propulsion than nuclear thermal propulsion. Uh, that is, hooking up a nuclear reactor to ion engines or something like that, then uh, just passing the propellant through a reactor in order to have it go at high speeds. You get more efficiency with, more efficiency with the electric propulsion. And overall, I think it's actually less complicated. Because the reactor is just doing what reactors normally do on Earth, which is pr produce electricity. The only question is the cost and the size of the ion engine, or whatever electric propulsion units you have. Again, not the best trajectory, but I'm sort of taking liberties because I know we've got enough delta V separation. Of course, doing nuclear thermal, a uh, nuclear electric propulsion in Kerbal Space Program is a whole different thing than doing it in real life because it's tedious. It's very, very tedious. As the dog leg gets worse, the residual relative inclination gets higher, and it looks like we got 2.43 as the best we can do. So that's why I normally set a limit to about 10 degrees, which will normally result in 2 degrees leftover inclination, which is a lot to handle in low Earth orbit. Not as bad to a high orbit target, though. And separation and ignition. Okay, and shut down 296 by 275 is what we've got, and the uh, inclination that we had already. So, we just need to boost up down here. Okay, I think I'll take the 19.1 kilometers for now. Okay, ignition. Yeah, I'm 60 kilometers right now. Okay. Right around there. So, I mean, it's basically about the same time. Okay, so we're going to have to try and get things together, and then we'll launch the HAB segment. And hopefully I can do that a little bit better than I've done these two. Okay, there it is. I've only got two of the RL-10s on because... It's not a very hefty burn, so ignition. I'm sort of correcting a little bit here too. Okay, that'll be good enough first. Probably should have ensured that that ended up suborbital. We're pretty close on the periapsis side, could have done that, but uh, we'll pretend. <laughs> If you see it turn without puffing, that's because I've got caps lock on. We have no reaction wheel in here. Okay, so like this, we'll be in render range in 30 minutes, which is there. So I'm just going to add a maneuver before that happens. And we'll jump to the other ship to do the main rendezvous burn. And we'll proceed from there. All right, we're still a hundred kilometers out, so I'm gonna want to make sure we push the prograde vector very close to the target. Okay, uh, oh shoot, that's the wrong vector. <laughs> Whoops. Okay, that's not helping. 
This is now wanton use of a EUS here. Alright, that's the end of that. This I should probably have plotted a little bit better. Okay, for now I'll take the 10 kilometers. And jump to that ship, which we have passed the node for. But fortunately the node was ahead of time anyway, so we're not there yet. And here we are entering render range. Okay, and hold steady. Let's align this other side. Even though I can't see a darn thing around here. Since this now has two sets of RCS ports, this should be better at translation than before. Though, two sets of RCS ports also means more usage of propellant. Okay, sorry about the complete inability to see anything. It's so wandering off. Okay, we're docked. Alright, RCS off. Next bit, we're just on time. Okay, approaching at fairly high speed. I don't know if we have enough MMH and NTO to kill velocity like this. I think it might be time to fire up the nuke. Nukes, in point of fact. Okay, select target. Uh, most of our problems occurred because I forgot to switch to target with that other piece. Okay, might as well start them up now. They take a while to spool up. Lots of pinkish purple. Magenta? Probably magenta. The RCS they had planned had nothing to do with docking the pieces together. Presumably that was for other stuff. Oh, sunlight. Sunlight. We have sunlight, finally. There's Earth. Unfortunately, keeping Earth in view makes all this dark, so we have to take this side. Now, I didn't mention it explicitly before, but obviously this is meant to be reusable with the HAB and all. It's supposed to go to Mars and come back, hang out in orbit, get refueled, and go again. Uh, it's not it's not a one-use deal here. And considering how heavy the tanks are in their plan, it's sure worth having them up here and reusing them because you wouldn't want to carry the tanks again. You basically want, you know, sort of a balloon tank, hydrogen, uh, liquid hydrogen tank or something like that. Something lightweight, whereas these are probably heavy because they have the controllers, the RCS stuff, um, the solar panels, the docking ports, and of course, also all the boil off prevention stuff. You know, whatever insulation, insulation should not be that much, but it's probably other stuff considering how heavy these things are. And then not to mention the back end, of course. Which is, I mean, those are really heavy engines. 10 tons of engines just right there, at least. We've built in the rest of it into the dry mass of the tank, but it's possibly heavier than that. But I've used way too much. I've used way too much RCS. Okay. Okay, it's all together now. Let's launch the payload. Okay, so here we have the HAB launch, and I've put the Kerbals in just for simplicity's sake. Unfortunately, because of the way we rendezvoused with that last tank, uh, that has thrown off our two-day orbit. It's now no, no longer a two-day orbit, basically. So we are going to have a little bit more of an interesting time rendezvousing with this. But that's fine. We just need to launch right now. And SAS on, throttle is up. Actually, it's been an interesting time rendezvousing with it anyway, so 
Nothing much has changed. Ignition. And launch. So as we leave the launch clamps, as you can see, two years and 270 days of food, water, and oxygen in here. And that's primarily what makes up the dry mass of this. Um, that, that's included in the dry mass, the 47 tons that we have here. The actual module, I don't have the mass of it right now, but it's, it's a fair amount. It's like about 20 tons on its own without the food, water, and oxygen. The diameter of the HAB is 8.4 meters, so it's equal to the diameter of the SLS. And I'm assuming that it is actually constructed out of SLS frames, if you will. That would simplify things. And the Starship is 9 meters, that's why I said, in general, the habitable area of this is, you know, it's not the same size as Starship. Starship is bigger because of its front end, uh, but it's not that far off from the habitable area of Starship, so. Okay, booster set. Okay, fairing set. And there's the hab. With some token insulation probably needs some sort of Whipple micrometeoroid shielding sort of thing around it too. In general the area down here, the service module area, would be enough uh, volume to contain the water, oxygen, and the propellants that we are carrying. Um, the food of course would probably be in the main cabin but it doesn't take up uh, that much space it's a fair volume. I mean, it's the equivalent of 23,000 liters. It's not a small space, but there is space for it. Okay, we're at the end of the core stage here. And separation ignition, interstage explosion, nozzle extension. It sort of like, looks like a little tadpole or something. Actually, with the full body, it looks sort of like a whale. Because of the eyes. A reason that the windows would be at the top level and the bottom level would be more of a private area or utility, utility area. I don't think they'd put windows right in the middle. So there's a floor here. There's a floor here. Okay, and we are making orbit, and let's let it run for a little bit, and shut down 302 by 222. So now we have to wait, so we'll do part of the waiting first, oh, we'll move that forward. Uh, 900 there. That's close. I guess we'll take it. 3.5 kilometers, huh? Well, we'll try it. Okay, that aside. Oh, we might as well get the solar panels out. Okay, ignition for the first burn. Okay, let me fine-tune that with RCS. Uh, well, 500 meters, that seemed pretty well. While we had 500 meters, it seemed pretty good. Okay, stop, stop, stop. We don't have backward-facing thrusters because they're on the bottom of this and the hab itself would be in the way, so... All right, we will take what we got there. So this can only hold steady. The other side has to do the docking in this case. I definitely want the stage to go off at least a kilometer away. Don't really want it hanging out too close to everything else. Okay, well, we'll take that. Yeah, alright. That's that's a safer distance away. Let's turn off RCS for a sec, separate that off. And control from here temporarily. 
RCS on. Okay. Now control from here. Okay, approach is looking fine right now. The fact that we've used half of our RCS fuel isn't great for the long term part of this. I feel like I should deploy some tugs and use tugs to move them all the modules around instead of having them use their own fuel to dock and everything. I don't know what the plan is. I guess maybe send the modules to Gateway and have its arm put them together or something like that. But even getting them close to the arm requires some fuel. I mean, getting it to the station, let's put it that way. Okay, we can see that without the HAB module, we have 7,200 meters per second left here. We've lost some of the liquid hydrogen there. Okay, we're all together. We went from 7,200 to 5,000. And actually, we would have less if not for the fact that we've used so much RCS fuel. Uh, so it's a, sort of a toss-up how good that is. All right, so we've gotten it all together. And I think I'll save the question of whether we can get to... I mean, Delta V-wise, we can get to Mars, right? But whether we can transfer, get to Mars, and come back home... I'm going to save for the next video, and depending on how it goes, it might be a short video, it might be a longer video, we'll see. There is boil-off here, so that is a question. Maybe, well, well, we'll see about that. I'm going to Alt F5 right now, and we might do more than one test. But after all, it takes a little bit of work getting all this together, but here it is in Earth orbit, in high Earth orbit. Our apoapsis is 176,000 kilometers, periapsis fairly low. And yeah, in the next video, I will see if it can get to Mars and back. We'll find out. So with that, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.